many of you forgot that it was Time Change Sunday? A few. Those who came early and we got about 10 paces ahead of you when the gates of heaven opened, just to let you know. <laughs> Something about messing with time. That seems like a God thing, not a human thing. I don't know what we're doing. I, I never complain in the fall, but this, this bothers me. <laughs> it's good to see you. We've had a really busy week. Uh, God's doing so many good things here at the church. Uh, earlier in the week, the elders got away for a couple of days uh, to pray and to just think about uh, where we are as a church. Hope you felt prayed up and prayed about six hours for you guys. We prayed over our role and, and we'll continue to do that. We love you and we will continue to pray for you to serve you any way we can. Just know that. And Friday night, we had our big ladies adorned event. There's over 200 women here in the auditorium. I'm so grateful for you to show up. And so many of you invited uh, some women who, who don't have a church home or who don't know Jesus personally. A couple of ladies who were from a Buddhist faith and there's many others that, that you know, just need uh, a personal relationship with Christ came. So thank you for that. Uh, you have an opportunity to invite your neighbors in a couple weeks to our neighbor fest. We're going to host that here on our campus. We've got uh, some things outside we'll do, a, a market for adults, games for kids, just a way to celebrate Easter, but more importantly, just to introduce people to our church family. So I hope you'll uh, take part in Neighbor Fest in a, in a couple of weeks, and then we'll have Easter. Praise God. We'll have a Good Friday service, Easter Sunday. I can't wait to celebrate that with you. Uh, we remain on mission here as a church and uh, I'll be heading to Columbia, South America with Kay in a few days. There's a big pillar international event there. There'll be hundreds of pastors that will be training and encouraging. There's, there's actually a bit of a revival taking place in South America, and we're, we're excited to, to join in on that. And so uh, pray for us as we do that as we remain on mission. Uh, I was so blessed uh, this morning to see one of our church, one of our first uh, church planning families uh, came to visit with us. Where are the Turleys at? Stand up, Turleys, Tanner, stand up, Marsha, and all the kids. How many years ago, Tanner, did we send you? 14, 14 years ago. We sent out the Turleys when it was just two. And, uh, and now look at them, 14 years later. They've been serving faithfully in then Medford, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Um, I, I just can't thank them enough for their faithfulness, their perseverance, uh, to see my spiritual son now and all that God's done through him. Such a blessing. And yes, like Seth, I feel old as all this stuff is taking place. But God is good. Joshua 20. Joshua 20. So I had... I had a troubled dream um, this week. It's, it's a familiar troubled dream that I have, and you may have something similar. So it's a dream where I'm running away from danger. I don't know what the danger is. I just know I got to run. You ever had that dream? Like there's something behind me super dangerous that wants to get me, and I got I to gotta get away. And so I'm running, but I can't run fast enough. I'm like, try to run as fast as I can, but I'm in super slow motion. I, what in the world? And I know I can run faster than this. And I'm straining all I've got. And when I finally get to the place where I think is a place of safety, the scene changes. Like, I'm like, what happened to this scene? And now I'm running again. And then I, and I woke up, you know, just mind troubled, spirit troubles. Like, Lord, what, what's going on? I just felt like I, I needed a place of safety. I needed a place of protection. And in my dream, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Protection and refuge. And, and how do you find that when you need it? And where do you go to find it? I, I love medieval history. I'm, I'm all about the lords and the knights and the, the serfs and the little kingdoms and the wars and everything. I'm fascinated by the medieval church. It was just so crazy. Um, and, and, and so many things were off kilter. But one of the things that, that happened in the medieval church, if somebody needed to find refuge, let's say they had committed a crime or let's say they had killed somebody. 
and, and, and they knew that there was a, a, an active priest in a cathedral, they would run to the cathedral and rush into the, the cathedral uh, of the church and they would, they would cry out sanctuary. And in, in crying out sanctuary, if the priest was there, then the priest would actually listen to the confession of the person. And then the priest had the authority to uh, provide refuge for that person, no matter what crime they had committed. They had to cry out sanctuary, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, if you want the cartoon version of this or the story a version of this. And, and then the priest had the authority to, to, to grant them uh, protection. But if that happened, the person then had to go and live as an exile, had to leave quickly and, and live as an exile. But it was, this, it was this interesting, you know, sort of right that the church had that I'm, I'm convinced came out of the passage of Scripture that we're going to talk about today in Joshua 20 and, and 21. But now... Let me, let me give you uh, a truth that is imperative. I don't, don't care what faith background you come from or you may say, I really don't have any faith. Here's the truth. You have to pay for your sin because there's a God and he's holy. And the way the Bible talks about it is simply this. The wages of sin is death. Right? The wages... What you've earned because of your sin against God, the, the payment of that is your life. The wages of sin is death. Now think about that. If that's the case, then you need protection. But here's the irony. You need protection from the same God. The same God in whom you owe your life the payment of your sin is death to, that same God is the only God that can protect you. So how does that work? How can you make sure that, that you understand both the penalty of your sin against God, the punishment that's deserving, and the protection that is available to you? And we're gonna find that in the story of Joshua and the nation of Israel. Let me show you what the Bible says about this. Now, I want to actually begin in Joshua 21 and then go back to Joshua 20. So if, if you're visiting, so glad you're here. So glad you're able to witness the baptisms. Um, we've been studying Joshua and we're at the dramatic place where after 500 years when God made a promise to Abram that he was going to give him a land and a nation, so many people, 500 years later, God was fulfilling his promise because Abraham's descendants were now inhabiting Canaan land, the promised land. Joshua and the army of Israel had conquered all of Canaan, and now all of the territories of Canaan had been divided up per tribe, all of the tribes. Large chunks of land were given to the tribes of Israel for them to go and inhabit to, to uh, 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 build their families, build farms, be productive. And, and as the Israelites were dispersing all of the land, there was one of the 12 tribes that wasn't given a large section of land. They weren't given a, a territory, and that was the tribe of Levi. Now, the Levites were, of the 12 tribes, a tribe that God had set apart, Moses and Aaron were Levites, and God had set apart this particular tribe to serve all the other tribes. So they didn't get one huge plot of land like the other tribes did, but instead they were divided up all across Canaan into 48 cities. And so now Joshua 21 and verse 1, the Bible says, <coughs> the, the Levite family heads approached the priest Eleazar and Joshua, this is the leader of the army of Israel and the nation of Israel, Joshua the son of Nun, and the family heads of the Israelite tribes at Shiloh. So uh, in Canaan, they had determined that the, the city Shiloh, this place of peace, is where they would construct the tabernacle, the tent where God would meet his people. 
And, and if you're going to worship God, you had to bring your sacrifices there at Shiloh, and the priests then would help you in worship. So the Israelite clan heads and the, the, uh, the Le- Levitical clan heads and all the other Israelite clan heads met with the high priest and Joshua at Shiloh, and, and then the uh, family heads of the Israelites said, the Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to live in <coughs> with their pasture lands for our livestock. So the Israelites, by the Lord's command, gave the Levites these cities with their pasture lands from their inheritance. And so as you can look on the map. So the huge now nation of Israel that's divided up on both sides of, of, the, of the Jordan River. It has 48 cities that is dispersed amongst all the tribes. And basically all the other tribes said, okay, we'll give you these cities that you can live in. And, uh, and so they were all given a city, and so the Levitical families could live there, and they were given a little bit of land so they could, you know, have a garden and, and have, have some uh, animals to live there and, 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 and provide for their families. But it's not like they could farm the land or till a forest or anything because they had been set apart to serve the people uh, as priests, and, and they were actually dependent upon the people to provide for a lot of their income. So when anyone would come to Shiloh to worship, uh, often they would come with what's called a tithe, which means they gave a 10, 10% of their wealth, of the harvest, of their flocks, uh, to the Levitical priests to uh, provide for them for their welfare and, and, and their care. So these, these Levites were set-apart people that, that really became a part of the inheritance for the rest of Israel. In other words, the Levites were gifts from God to God's people. Now, um, uh, they were able to perform the sacrifices in the tabernacle. They were able to instruct people in the law. And then there's, a, there's an analogy here. Now, as a pastor, I'm not a priest. I'm not a priest, we all are a priesthood. You're just as much a priest as I am. But I serve, along with the other pastors of this church, we serve as God's gift to you. And, and what we represent is that God is with you and that his word is with you. And, and we function to serve the people of God so that we can fulfill God's desire. The desire that God had for the nation of Israel was that they be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people set apart for his own glory. And unfortunately, Israel didn't do a good job in responding to that well and bringing God glory, but we're going to do that because we're the church. And, and yet, what's so, it's, it's so incredible to understand that just as there were, you know, 48 cities of, of, of Levitical uh, priests scattered uh, all across the nation of Israel, to serve God's people, there are hundreds of thousands of churches all over the world. Today, hundreds of thousands of churches will gather just like we've gathered and worship God. Isn't that incredible? And in those churches, there will be hundreds of thousands of pastors serving God's people in those churches. We are God's gift to God's people so that we can be a holy nation, a chosen, set-apart people to worship God for his glory, just as Peter said, we are God's own possession. So, so what God is doing through the Levitical priests in chapter 21 is he is preserving his people through the gift of these spiritual leaders. All right, now, in chapter 20, we're going to go back and we're going to look at the entire chapter. It's just nine verses. We're going to see that God not just preserves his people, but God protects his people from the penalty of sin, but not through the gift of priests, but through the gift of his son. Right now, I've got to set the context for this. And remember, the wages of sin is death. All right. If you are a human person, you are made in God's image. And God has set you apart from all other creation because you bear the image of God. 
And because you're breathing, God has given you lifeblood. In other words, that double foot keeps you alive so that you can now display God's image for God's glory. Now, because of the sanctity of human life, God, who is just, takes it as an especially egregious sin if someone were to murder you, right? There's a lot of sins. But to take the life of someone who bears God's image is especially egregious to God. And so if, I, if we go back to Genesis chapter 9, when the world had become so incredibly wicked, the God said, okay, I, I can't deal with this anymore. You are no longer bringing me glory, bearing my image. And so I'm going to wipe out the world. He did it through a global flood. Every, by the way, every world religion and every nation has a story of a global flood. They just don't have the biblical one. They don't have the details. But so there's this global flood, wipes out everybody except for faithful Noah and his family who are on the ark. So the ark finally lands and Noah and his family, they they come out and all the animals begin to disperse uh, throughout now the the, uh, restructured world. And, and then God says to Noah, he says, okay, now, go and multiply people who bear my image all over the world. The same command that he gave to Adam and Eve. Go make a ton of babies, repopulate the earth with people who bear my image. And he said, by the way, see all these animals that are running around? You get to eat them now. Praise God. To the glory of God. You can eat the animals. But he said, um... I don't want you drinking blood. I don't want you eating blood. There's something special about blood. It represents life. And then he said this. Whoever sheds human blood, I'm reading Genesis 9 and 6. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans, his blood will be shed. For God made humans in his image. Whoever murders by a human person the murderer must be put to death because they took away a person made in my image. So we see capital punishment ingrained in the character of God, in the commands of God, way before the law was given to Moses. All right, are you with me? Now, when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, thousand plus years later, um, the law was summarized by 10 commands. And one of the commands was, thou shall not what? Yeah. So probably it's better to say murder than kill. I know that um, King James is kill. It means murder, right? Because we ask military law enforcement to kill, and that's not murder. It's thou shall not murder. Thou shall not murder. Premeditated, out of anger, out of, out of revenge, taking of a human life. That's what thou shalt not do. Thou shalt not murder. Cannot take a human life. It's a made in God's image. I don't care if the human life is that size. Right? Or I don't care if that life is a hundred years old. I don't care. If they bear the, the image of God, it's sacred. It's sacred, right? So you can't do that. Now, Numbers 30 says that if someone does murder, then they have to be put to death blood for blood. God is just. And this is how justice is served, the wages of sin. Remember. Okay, now, here's the interesting thing. God is just. God is merciful. If you don't get this, you don't get God. Some people like to weigh in on the justice of God. Some people like to weigh in on the the mercy of God. He is both. And these attributes of God come together perfectly, always for eternity. And, And now we're going to see how the justice of God and the mercy of God come together in Joshua 20. And here's the here's the scenario. Now, we know that if, if somebody kills somebody, 
then there has to be blood for blood. You have, you have killed a human eye. But, but now what if the person does it unintentionally? All right, so uh, here's Chuck. And, and let's say Chuck and I are Israelites from the tribe of Ephraim in the hill country. And we've just been given all this land and there's all these trees in the land. I said, Chuck, let's cut down some trees. Let's, 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 let's make some room for our sheep. All right, Chuck said, let's go. And so he grabs his ax and I grab my ax and we're, we're out there and we're just, just starting to whack down trees. And so I'm cutting this tree down and I'm, I'm getting ready for the big ax swing. And I go and I hear a thud as I'm coming through, which interrupts my delivery. <laughs> and I'm like, what's up? And I look back and Chuck is laying on the ground, bleeding profuse, profusely. And, and then Chuck dies in this story. <laughs> And I'm there looking at, and I'm looking at, now here's the thing. I didn't want to kill Chuck. I didn't mean to kill Chuck, but I killed Chuck. And, and, and we call that manslaughter because I actually did kill him, though it was unintentional. Blood for blood. I, there's, gotta be, there's gotta be life for life, even though that was unintentional. So what happens? Well, the justice of God and the mercy of God. God has provided a means for me now to receive mercy if I can make it to a place of refuge. And so throughout the Levitical cities scattered throughout Canaan, there were six cities. Do we have that map up? There were six cities. So here's all the Levitical cities on both sides of the Jordan River. And the ones with the flags are the designated cities of refuge. Now here's the beauty of this. Now I just killed Chuck. If I can flee, and if I know the way to get to a city of refuge, then if I make it there, then I can be provided safety. Safety from what? Well now let's read. Uh, the Lord spoke to Joshua, Joshua 20 and 1. Tell the Israelites, very similar to what we have in Numbers, I believe, uh, 35, almost taken word for word. Select your cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses. All right, so Moses gave this instruction before um, Joshua entered in the land, and now it's just being repeated. So that a person who kills someone unintentionally or accidentally may flee there. These will be your refuge from the, what's the next phrase? The what? Avenger of blood. Okay, no, all right. This is actually a person. So let me explain. I know for you guys, like this is cool, the avenger of blood. How do I get to be that? <clears throat> all right, the avenger of blood, uh, the Hebrew is just a little word called goel. And, and actually, the best way to translate goel is is a redeemer for the kinsman, a redeemer for the family, or a, or a kinsman redeemer. Uh, Boaz is a very famous kinsman redeemer. Now, the kinsman redeemer, or the goel, had several responsibilities. One would be to make sure that the families are healthy and safe and bearing children. The other thing would be that if someone were to be killed in the family, in the clan, it was the goel its responsibility or the avenger of blood's responsibility to hunt that person down, to demand justice by way of a court, a trial, and if that person was found guilty of murder, it would be the avenger of blood's responsibility to actually kill that person. They had to put that person to death. Blood for blood, the wages of their sin. All right, so now we've got, we've got the, in the story, we've got the manslayer, all right, we would, in our language, we say the person who committed manslaughter, same language, the manslayer who now has to flee to a city of refuge because once the Goel or the kinsman redeemer of Chuck's family finds out that I killed Chuck with an ax, his responsibilities come after me and find me and kill me. All right, so this is what's happening. 
Um, These will be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Now, verse four, when someone flees to one of these cities, uh, they stand at the entrance of the city gate and state uh, his case before the elders of that city. And they are to bring him into the city and give him a place to live among them. Okay, so now, if, if, if I like, uh-oh, I just killed Chuck. Uh-oh, there's going to be somebody who's going to come after me. I take off running. I don't have time to pack a bag. I don't have time to say goodbye to my family. I take off running to one of the cities of refuge, whatever the closest one is, because they're equally spread apart. And if I make it to the city of refuge before the Goel gets me, then I rush to the city gates <laughs> and I grab hold of the gates of the city, which, by the way, always have to be open. There's some significance there. The gates of the, these cities, the cities of refuge, the door is always open. It's always open. And there would be the elders of the city. These were all the clan heads and the, you know, the rulers of the city, and they're hanging out, drinking coffee, talking about city business. I rush to them and I say, refuge, I need refuge. And they say, what did you do? I killed Chuck. I didn't mean it. It was an accident. I need refuge. Okay, come in. Let's talk to the priest. Let's talk to the priest. Okay, now, verse five. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, They must not hand the one who committed manslaughter over to him, for he killed his neighbor accidentally, and he didn't hate him beforehand. So, so now, um, let's let's say the kinsman redeemer for Chuck's clan shows up and is like, "Where's Dwayne? I am the Goel. I have to take his life. This is my obligation. Why? Because blood for blood." Someone who bore God's image has been killed. Life for life. And they say, yeah, but he did it. He's claiming he did it accidentally. So now there's a court. The priest comes out. And the priest now is part of the judiciary. And they're going to determine whether it was accidental or not. Now, if it comes out that some witnesses show up and they're like, this was no accident. Dwayne's been planning this whole thing for weeks now. He hates Chuck. Like, he can't stand Chuck. And he's just looking for the right opportunity to take Chuck's life. And, and he did it. And so if that's determined, then guess what? Goel gets to drag me outside the city and take my life. Right? Murder. Right? Thou shalt not murder. And, and but if it's like, no, we love Chuck. It's just a bad accident. All right, so then you don't get to kill him. You don't get to kill him. But now here's the thing, verse six. He has to stay in that city until he stands before trial and assembly. And then if they determine him guilty of manslaughter but not premeditated murder, he has to remain in the city until the death of the high priest serving at that time. So now this city becomes my sanctuary, my refuge. And as long as I live in that city, I'm safe, I'm protected. So this is my city of refuge. I don't have to walk around looking behind my shoulder. I don't have to bear the guilt and the shame. I don't have to do that. I'm safe as long as I'm there in the place of refuge. There's safety there. And if I choose to leave the city, okay, I've opened myself up to be killed. But as long as I remain hidden in the city. I got to remain hidden in the city. I'm safe. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, uh, if the high priest dies, I am now totally free. There's something about the death of the high priest that gives me total freedom. Now, keep that in mind, all right? So I'll, I'll make sure everything comes to light at the end. Okay. All right, so now, verse seven, so they designated the cities, um, you know, on the between the river and the sea portion on the west side, uh, Kadesh, uh, way up north, Naphtali and Galilee, where Jesus was raised, um, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and then uh, Hebron. Of course, Hebron would have to be one of the cities of refuge, right? 
Hebron becoming Jerusalem, of course. And then on the other side of the Jordan um, would be uh, Bezer up in the wilderness, and then in the middle, Ramoth Gilead, and then down south, the Golan, still called the Golan Heights today. So uh, what, what, what's important is they always made sure that these cities were equally dispersed, that you could make it to a city in about a half day, like if you could run well, uh, in about a half day's run. At the most, no longer than a day if you're a little bit slower like me. The, but you, you could within the day make it to one of these cities. And then the other thing was they had to always make sure the path of the cities was clear. And if... Uh, there was a crossroads that they would have a sign that says, that points, that says, this is the way to refuge. This is the way, this is the way for refuge. They knew the way, okay? And um, these cities were appointed in verse 9 for all the Israelites. And then what's the next phrase? And the what? and the aliens residing among them, not just Jews, but non-Jews, who were willing to find refuge in the God of Israel. God has always had a mission to be the God of all people, to be the refuge of all people. That's why we spend so much of our time and energy here on mission. God wants for all people to find refuge. All right, so now, God set this up to, to, to reveal his just character and his merciful nature. And now they're coming together perfectly. And, and the Bible begins to extrapolate on these cities of refuge Because now there's something important that we know about the character of God. God's just. Every sin you commit against God demands wages. And the wages of sin is what? Every sin. But there's the mercy of God. And now what we do is is we see God protecting his people from the penalty of their sins in the cities of refuge, but more importantly, we see this now in the nature of God. So for instance, when we get to Psalm 46, David, who is constantly fleeing for his life and constantly in need of refuge because people were trying to hunt him down and kill him like King Saul, David sings, God, you are my refuge. You're my strength. You're my helper. You're always there when I'm in trouble. You're always there when I'm in trouble. You're my refuge. You're my helper. You're my strength. Again, Psalm 91. I love this. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High. That's like fleeing to the city of refuge. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty hidden, hidden in God. And I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge? The one in whom I trust. You see that? And so, uh, let me tell you a really important prayer. And, And I want you to pray this often. Well, as often as you sin. If you don't sin, you don't have to pray this prayer. As often as you sin, you should, you, can, you should consider praying this prayer. It's very simple. God, I'm in trouble again. That's it. I'm in trouble again. I've done it again. I've done it again, God. I'm hateful. I'm jealous. I lusted. I stole. I lied. God, I'm back at the same place. I'm in trouble, God. I'm in danger. I know the wages of sin. 
And here I am again. That's such an important prayer. Because when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. But you gotta first say, I'm in trouble in order for you to find help from God who is our refuge. And, and yes, our sins can plague us. And at times it feels like they're suffocating us. And not to even forget, despite your sins, Satan who wants to destroy you. The evil avenger of blood who wants to destroy you before you get to the city of refuge. And listen, this may be so foreign if you're not a Christian. I want to I, I want to say this as, as lovingly as I can. You have an adversary who hates you and wants to destroy your life. And if you don't make it to refuge, then you're going to end up destroyed. So we have this adversary who wants to destroy us. And so we absolutely need refuge from the danger. And, and, and so now, here's the thing. In the greatness of God's mercy, he decided... I'm not just going to provide these cities that you have to escape to. I'm going to provide a person that you can escape to no matter where you are. Hallelujah. And that person is my son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is your city of refuge. Hallelujah. He's your refuge. In Hebrews chapter 6, here's what we need we need a sanctuary. We need a high priest. We need blood for blood. All of those things have to come together. So that through two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, God has to be just. He has to be just. He has to demand justice, life for life, blood for blood. He has to be merciful. <laughs> he has to be. He's God. We who have fled for refuge, right? Now you see this? We who have fled for refuge from the penalty of our sins might have strong encouragement to seize the hope that has been set before us. Just as, as this, and the manslayer had to seize those gates of the city pleading for refuge. We have this hope set before us who is Jesus Christ and we laid hold on him. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm, secure. As it enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus went to the most holy place on the cross life for life, blood for blood. Jesus said, my blood for yours. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Three. I will bleed for you. I will die for you. I will go into the most holy place. I'm not only the sacrificial lamb, the, the, the blood that will provide your atoning sacrifice. I am also the great high priest who performs this great sacrament for your soul. Come to me and you will have refuge. Come to me. He's our refuge. He's our strength. And remember, you know, the manslayer, he's got to flee to the city of refuge, but he's got to know the way. He's got to know the way. Jesus said, I am the what? I'm the way. And I'm the truth. And I'm the one who gives you life, not death. You want to know God? You come through me. I'm the way. He's the way to our refuge. He's the way to our protection. 
and anyone, Jew or Gentile, who wants to find refuge and protection from their sin, forgiveness from their sin, just simply needs to find Christ. Now, this is what Paul says in Colossians 3. The, the manslayer had to hide in the city of refuge. Uh, David said, I just need to hide in the shelter of the Almighty. Now, Paul says this, but I don't have time. I want actually you to meditate on this this week and maybe talk, talk about this in your small groups. Here's what Paul says. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what I want you to think about. What does it mean for your life to be hidden with Christ in God? What does it mean to live hidden behind the cross? Because when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will also appear with him in glory. You know, you know what that means? That means if you have found protection and refuge by confessing your sin and placing your faith solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that one day you will be able to lay hold of those gates of heaven. They'll be yours. Heaven will be refuge. It will be. It will never, ever feel guilty or feel shame because of your sin in heaven. But you cannot lay a hold of those gates unless you lay a hold of the cross and make sure light, your life is hidden in Christ. And, and so, look, here's the, here's the biggest difference. The city of refuge is only for those who unintentionally or accidentally killed somebody. Christ, who is our refuge, knows you intentionally sin all the time, and yet he still is willing to forgive you. Now, here, here's my appeal. I think for some of you, you've been waiting to give your life to Christ. I don't know why you've been waiting. That's between you and God, but you've been waiting. You've got a form of Christianity that's not real Christianity. It happens all the time. But listen, if your form of Christianity is not real Christianity, you're in danger. There's only one way. That's the only way. And it is through faith in Christ and Christ alone. But you also then are giving your life over to Christ. It's not me who lives anymore. My life is hidden behind the cross. And maybe, praise God, maybe today you will say, I'm done with my form of Christianity. I want the biblical form. I want my life to be hidden in Christ. I want to live for him now. Tell that to God. We're about to pray. Tell it to God. Now, secondly, some of you keep sinning You keep sinning. You just remain in unrepentant sin and it's guilt and shame after guilt and shame after guilt and shame. Why not give that up today? Why not find forgiveness and the peace and the joy that comes with that? You, you, now you know who you can go to. You don't have to live this way any longer. Listen, here, here's the truth. We find refuge in the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ who covers our sin and who justifies God's wrath. His death brings us freedom. His resurrection brings us hope. Our high priest died, and yet he lives and he lives forever. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, as these young brothers, Anderson and John, told their stories, 
of coming to faith in Christ and now giving their lives to Christ. I pray that even now some might be praying in repentance of sin, just weary from trying to figure out what life is and what truth is and what their form of religion is, that they would fully give themselves over to the truth of Jesus and his gospel and now live for Christ. Father, save anybody who needs to be saved. And, and for some here whom I love, may they fully repent and not, no longer have to deal with the guilt and the shame of, of unrepentant sin. May they find refuge and freedom by the power of your spirit in this moment, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.